Hello, this is a media project for my substance abuse class at Community College. I interview a man named Kevin, and we talk about his work as a substance abuse counselor back in the 1980s and what he had to do to become a substance abuse counselor back then. We also discuss his personal experiences with mental health and addiction and his personal views regarding addiction. As he would like to remain somewhat anonymous, this is being presented in podcast format with audio only. So, Kevin, what was uh, your title when you were I was, working? I was, for that particular treatment facility, I was called a monitor. A case, Mon- man- a case manager is what I was. Okay. Uh, it was set up so that I had, uh, I had patients that were in my therapy group. Mm-hmm. I also had a different set of patients that were in my case management group. I see. And then a third set of people that I would be involved with doing interviews, things of that nature. We, we tried to spread contact around amongst the staff, uh, more eyes on the, on the problems. What was your um, credential? Like what degrees? I was, I was a certified addictions counselor, a PCAB. PCAB? CAC, Certified Addictions Counselor. Pennsylvania Certified Addictions Counselor. Is that a two-year degree or? No, yeah. Well, no, it was, it was, I needed to present a case study. I needed to, it took three years to get the time in. Okay. Uh, it required supervised time. It, requ- it was sort of a catch-22. They also required paid time. Well, who was going to pay you if you weren't certified yet? So I did an internship and a residency at the hospital. Okay. Which the internship I paid for, the residency they paid for, which meant that I could technically claim I was I had an income. So you did? Did you go through any official schooling at all? No. Like a, no, no, I did not. I went. I went through their. The internship was six months. The residency so was, was was six on the months. Job. Yes. So I had so I had a year, you know, on the job training. Oh wow! Um, then I needed to present cases to the state certification board in order to get that final certification. That's just how Pennsylvania did it at the time. Interesting. The only thing the CAC allowed me to do that other people couldn't do was bill third-party insurance, and I wanted nothing to do with third-party insurance. That's actually what burned me out and took me out of the field. Was insurance? Was insurance. I'm not surprised. So how long did you do that for? Seven years. Okay. And if you don't mind my asking, what led you down that path to my own My own addiction. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah. I, I, when I was 28, a good friend of mine went away. I didn't know where he went. He just disappeared. And he made a mistake when he came back. He came back to the bar, which was not his, not a good idea for him. He mm-hmm. lost out in the end. But while he was there, I saw somebody who drank like I did and wasn't doing that anymore and seemed happy about that. Oh. And I never knew that was a possibility. That never crossed my mind that there were people who drank like I did and stopped and were okay. So um, that was your poison of choice, so to speak? You were you uh, I was a heroin addict for a while. Okay. Um, alcohol was just always there. I never saw alcohol as a problem. It's easy to get. Mm-hmm. It's everywhere. Yes, you know. it is. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, so I was addicted to heroin for about two years. Wow. Do you feel like the substances were a form of self-medication? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. There, some things I believe about addiction may make sense. Addiction, alcoholism, I believe there are different degrees of that. Mm-hmm. Um, when I talk about alcoholism or addiction, I'm talking about somebody who's physically addicted to the chemical or the or the or the drink. Uh, that to me is is alcoholism. Sure. Down from that, you've got problem drinking, and that's easy. Does mm-hmm. drinking create a problem in your life? If it does, you're a problem drinker, by mm-hmm. definition. That's that's an easy bridge to cross. Uh, and then there's social drinking, mm-hmm. and that that I just couldn't relate to that. I was never a social drinker. Um, there was no, there was no drinking in my home growing up. My parents were religious and thought there was no such thing as social drinking. Mm-hmm. So I didn't, I didn't learn to drink. I, I didn't learn anything about social drinking. 
the people that taught me to, how to drink were alcoholics that I oh. met after I left home. So what I thought was normal was mm -hmm. not normal, but I had no I had no basis to, to make a judgment of that. Interesting. Um, so your program to become an addiction counselor, you had to go through a year of work mm -hmm. as an yeah. internship mm -hmm. and then do case studies, present yes. case studies. Yes. How long I spent, ago was I, that? I spent two years just at the work of getting certified. How long hey. ago was that? Uh, yeah. I was 20. Oh, so that was back when you were 20. Oh gosh, it was, yeah, I was in my early 30s. Yeah, see, it's different now. And with the issues and the prevalence of heroin mm -hmm. nowadays, they actually started a new certificate program here at our school for substance abuse counseling. Okay. See, I have I have a bachelor's degree, I have a liberal arts degree in history. Uh -huh. And they wanted they wanted college. They didn't specify that it had to be substance abuse, it had to be medical, it had to be you, you had to be a psychiatrist or a, a psychologist. They would have loved that. Yeah. But had I been a psychologist, I wouldn't have needed the state certification. Okay, so you already had college degree before yeah. you did that. Mm -hmm. Okay, it mm -hmm. just wasn't in a related field. Correct. That was a long time ago now, so yeah, it definitely it changed how they're doing things. So you said you were addicted to heroin for yes. two years. What was it that got you to kick it? There was no way I could justify in my own mind being a social IV drug user. It was really that simple. I, yeah. I, was, I had crossed the line. Addiction for me, problems for me, was it, it was like a continuum, like drawing a series of lines in the sand and then continually stepping over the next line and over the next line. I see. And, and my last line was heroin addiction. You know, I finally stepped over that last line could no longer in any way, shape, or form justify what I was doing, even to myself, and uh, ended up in treatment. Ended up, I, I stopped using heroin. My drinking got out of control at that point. You know, I was substituting one for another. And um, then my friend went away. And that was, you know, so I when I went to treatment, I went there, I went there because of my drinking, I thought. They saw, they took one look at my history and said, oh my, we have much more to talk about than you're drinking. <laughs> so that was, I was 28 when that occurred. I'm 65 now, so it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, it has been a while. Did you have any close calls with heroin? No, no. I didn't. Well, that's no, fortunate. Didn't. Yeah. That's fortunate. Because I know sometimes it takes that close call where someone ODs and they're like, whoa, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. And that is what pushes them over the edge. So it seems like you were able to, you were rationalizing the whole time. And at yes. some point you were like, wait a minute. I couldn't rationalize it any longer. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I, I just, I was doing something that was very against my own beliefs and, and you know, what I thought was acceptable. And so a change had to occur. And, I, and, and in my friend, I found an opportunity to, to affect that change. Seeing what he went through and going Seeing through what recovery. He went through, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, he, like I said, he shouldn't have come back to the bar because he, he was drinking within two months. But That's within true. a month, I was in treatment. Wow. Wow. Okay. I'm trying to think of what I was going to That's okay. It was, it was actually sort of funny. I when i was questioning whether or not i needed help yeah. i went to my expert on alcohol my bartender and asked her you know geez you know just suppose maybe there might be something wrong here what can you do you can only go bowling so many times and she looked at me and she said kevin i haven't had a drink for more than three years and i haven't been bowling once it was just, I mean, there was this serendipity happening all yeah. through there. You know, I kept running into people that instead of being a drag on me were, were impetus to move further. That's, that's fortunate. Because mm -hmm. it can go either way with yeah. life. You never know. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really fortunate that it went that way for you. Um, now, if you don't want to answer, you don't have to, but what what do you think you were 
self-medicating for? What were there issues that you know you were trying to process that you were trying to like numb things or? No, I think I didn't think that deeply about it at the time. Looking back, I believe why the reason that medications, the reason that drugs were so appealing to me, was because of adoption and all that trauma that wasn't identified. So here I was experiencing all of all the classic, I'm not good enough, I don't belong here, I'm not really a member of the family, uh, blood is thicker than water was a phrase I heard, not a phrase you want to use with an adoptee. And all of that was going on and I discovered that there was a way to feel better than I felt normally. Huh. Uh, I had my first drug when I was in fifth grade. Wow. My mother, uh, my adoptive mother had some pills that she got from her brother-in-law, my uncle. Mm -hmm. He was a doctor and he had written on the pill bottle for that jump out of the window feeling. And I saw that and thought, well, that's either going to make me feel like I can jump out of a window or not want to jump out of a window. And either answer was fine with me. So I took the pills. Uh, and, and there was a major discovery at that point. I discovered there was something in the world that made me feel better than good. I thought That's... good, I thought I felt good. Yeah. And, and here was this thing that made that feel a lot better. Wow. And I wanted to do it again. But you've been clean since you were like 28, you said? Uh, I, I had a liver transplant and uh, was into, was given oxycodone. Oxycontin mm -hmm. for that, and was addicted to Oxycontin for a while. Yeah, it's that's not, it wasn't the same. It was it was physical addiction without all the psychological stuff that goes with addiction. Right. Um, Do you feel like it's because of your prior issues that it was easier to become addicted to that, or was it just kind of happenstance? Because you know how those prescriptions. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. I think it was a physiological function of weight and time that, mm -hmm. that my, my body size, my weight, given this chemical for this amount of time and you will in fact be physically addicted. I was yeah. physically addicted to Oxycontin. Um, you didn't misuse your abuse. Now the difference between getting over that, mm -hmm. the, the difference between getting over that and getting over psychological addiction, I'd much rather deal with physical addiction. Really? Yeah much easier can you tell me what the difference is between them um the person who's physically addicted for, for we take somebody we send them to the hospital they're mm -hmm. there for some reason they get addicted to the medication they're on right they stop the medication that person feels shitty they feel withdrawal they don't ever want to do that again ever and they're probably pissed off with the people that gave them the med right the addict on the other hand, that's great. I like this. I want to know how to do it again. I'm not interested in stopping it. And these people are my friends. Right. You know, I see what you mean. That's how it's like I. It's a totally different perspective. Oh my right. yes. Oh my yes. And, and I believe for some people that's that's physiological. I believe there are people who process alcohol differently than non-alcoholics. I used to be able to go through the whole chemical chain and tell you what that was. But uh, the non-alcoholic, the non-alcoholic doesn't process the chemical into the same chemicals as the alcoholic processes them into. And it's not a matter of willpower. Uh, and in some cases, it is a matter of willpower. The problem drinker, mm -hmm. uh, they, they can stop make a decision um, yeah they can make a decision and may be able to stop the alcoholic the one that physiologically processes that drug differently can't make that decision it's it's and it's like telling someone um telling someone who's lactose intolerant to drink that glass of milk and then not suffer the consequences they can't they process milk differently than i do that's a good analogy. Yeah, and they have no control over that. Interesting. So did your addiction issues cause rifts with your adoptive family or? It was largely, it was largely hit. Uh, my father died when I was 19. 
and uh, I moved to the West Coast to get away from my mother, who was the abusive party in that in that family. So I moved 3,000 miles from home, and she saw none of that. I got gotcha. you. Uh, my father didn't see any of that. As, as a teenager, I wasn't that involved. I was interested in going out Saturday night, Friday night, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that was pretty much all it was. Uh, it didn't it didn't really take off until I moved to California and was surrounded by these alcoholics who were teaching me how to drink and teaching me how to use other drugs. I see. It's interesting, you know, the surroundings really do have an effect. Oh my, yes. You know, I, I grew up in a very suburban neighborhood and if there was drugs around, I really wasn't aware mm -hmm. of it. And I really didn't encounter anything. You know, my parents drank a glass of wine every day. So that was like, yeah. Not a big deal. We got to try a little shot glass of wine when you were like seven years old and stuff. So it wasn't a big deal. People in chronic pain that need to treat their, their illness with medication, with, with narcotics for a while, mm -hmm. will in fact become addicted. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter what their mindset is, how, social, how, how, how psychologically sound they are. If right. they use that drug for that length of time, they will be physically addicted to the drug and will sense. experience withdrawal if they stop it. So that needs to be part of their treatment plan is an awareness that this is gonna be a problem that they're gonna to have to address. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, what, what do you feel were some of the pros and cons of working as an addiction counselor? Did you feel like it was rewarding? Was there oh more my, frustration yes. or more? No, before, before the insurance companies got involved, it was wonderful. It was like working in Camelot. Um, really? Oh my! There, there. We we were turning people away who wanted to come into treatment. So we were dealing with a very motivated group of people. I uh, see. Well, sometimes there were some who their motivation wasn't really all that hot, and that's what therapists for. Um, but no, it was it was a very supportive environment. Uh, yeah. Everybody was working on their own well-being uh, a lot of staff support we had a we had a staff meeting every day that was more like a therapy session a staff than a staff meeting mm -hmm. uh, just a very close-knit group what what happened to me was as the insurance companies changed their their tactics uh, there was a time where they want to deny treatment where that's their job is to deny coverage. That's what insurance companies do. Mm -hmm. And initially I could send them a letter saying, in my opinion, discharging this patient now would constitute a hazard, not only to them, but to others. And they dropped that. They they didn't want to touch that with a, with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> then they changed. Their attorneys said, okay, we understand that, but we're not going to pay for it. You it know, makes no sense so, at all. No, it doesn't make any sense. It, it it's just sort it's just very short-sighted all the way around um, but i agreed to be the liaison with the insurance companies because that wasn't going well and i sort of have the gift of gab with that um, but what happened was i took personal responsibility for people staying in treatment i shouldn't have done that that no. was not my personal responsibility yeah. I began to believe that, geez, if only I'd have found the right words, if only I'd have made the right argument, if only, yeah. if only, if only this person would still be in treatment. Instead of that, what I ended up needing to do is sit down with that person who we probably spent two weeks convincing they needed treatment mm -hmm. and tell them, oh, by the way, we're going to have to discharge you. And that broke me. Yeah, that would be that would bring about such a level of that caregiver burnout mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know that when you're trying to take that on yourself like if I, you can't take that kind of responsibility on yourself it's up to the individual but then like you're saying to convince them to be there and then be like well you got to go that would be really oh, that difficult. Was horrible that was i can't horrible. even imagine but there were the, and there was no good answer. There were the people who were pleased to learn that, which meant they hadn't really made it in treatment yet. And then were the ones, then there were the ones who were in tears in my office because they didn't want to go. Yeah, it was horrible. It was just, it was horrible.
Um, I can't imagine that. I did that for three months and I ended up in the hospital. You know, and, yeah. and that was a combination of things. It, it gets confusing because of the bipolar. Mm -hmm. I wasn't identified as having bipolar until I was 50. Wow, yet. that's a late diagnosis. Well, what happened was I wasn't going to see a doctor when I felt good. And if you feel like God, why would you ask for help? Right. Those were the upswings. I would ask for help when I was in the basement. Yeah. And they would, nobody asked about adoption in all those in all those years, nobody asked me if I was adopted. They asked, what was your family like? What was your Perfect. growing up like? And as someone still in the fog, I said, oh, it was fine. There was nothing wrong with my family. So they never looked beyond the depression and diagnosed uh -huh. me as having major depressive disorder uh -huh. and began to try to treat that. Well, it's a different, it's a different illness. They don't respond to the same treatment. Right. So they would start me on a medication I would want this to work, would believe it was working, may have even started back up on a, on a, an upswing, a manic swing. Mm -hmm. Terrific. I'm cured. This is wonderful. And then right. the downswing comes, I'm depressed again. Psychiatrists are saying, well, sometimes this happens. The medication doesn't work. We'll start you on a new med. So I was on this medical, this, this medication merry-go-round for years. Their, their final, they finally used ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, to try to get rid of the depression. That didn't work. Uh, and then another doctor, a, a new doctor came in and, and talked to me for about 15 minutes and said, well, no wonder you're bipolar. It just took the right person to talk to you to get yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that still creates problems, but now I know what it is. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble with a manic phase now. Um, and I can tell that because it's not situational. There's nothing going on in my life that should you know, have me excited. As a matter of fact, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. <laughs> Being excited and happy probably isn't related to that. Yeah, probably not. Probably. Although there's good news though, with the vaccine getting out there and the mm -hmm. numbers are leveling off, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if it's enough to be excited. <laughs> yeah, that must have been really difficult to not have answers for so long and go through all this trial and error of treatment. And that had to be really frustrating. And I'm sure it, it didn't, uh, didn't help matters at well, all. It was, it was depressing, I'll tell you that. Yeah. And, and it was, it was a constant... You no, know, it was it was a constant. Come here, come here, come here. Go away, go away. You know, this will work. This will make it better. This will be fine. Boom. You know this. This okay. We have to try something else. Uh, no, I'm. I'm. It's been. Oh well, shit! I'm 65. It's been 15 years since uh, I was diagnosed with bipolar, and and there have certainly been ups and downs during that time. It, it's not something that goes away but knowing what it is makes all the difference in the world and having people in my you. life who know that that's a possibility makes all the difference in the world as well uh, basically like fills in the blanks for you i guess uh, yeah yeah that'd be that would have to be very trying to be trying to figure out what's going on and not have answers mm -hmm. for so long it's amazing it took so long to get somebody that figured it out though i mean i don't know i don't know why nobody asked me about about manic states um they just didn't they they just didn't do good biopsychosocials bottom line is they missed important questions in the assessment process and they were treating what they assessed but they didn't look at the whole picture yeah that's important mm-hmm that's yeah, definitely. don't don't underestimate a good history. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, I think that's about it. I really appreciate you taking oh, the sure, time. Oh, sure, no problem.
In closing, I want to thank Kevin for being willing to let me record a conversation with him. He talked about some very personal but really important stuff, and I hope you got something out of it. This was produced for Professor R.J. Cantor at West Virginia Northern Community College in my substance abuse class, and I use music from bensounds.com and my name is Jennifer Matthews. Thanks for listening.